Hello and welcome to the Big Nose. This week on the show, I travelled to Cape Town, South Africa to catch up with an old college friend of mine. Of course, I was travelling with the new airline, that is Zoom Airlines. Ashling Farrell has been living in South Africa since last year. I wanted to catch up with her and so get a better sense of how life in South Africa was treating a Roscommon native. Ashling gave me a great insight into how she has settled in, adjusting to life in a new country, and how South Africa has responded to the global pandemic that is COVID-19. Stay tuned for that interview a little later on. But first, as is the big nose, I must first of all sniff out the main stories in the Irish media this week. And first and foremost, we start off with a emotional story, I suppose. Coming of no surprise that it's the first and probably the most dominant story of the week. It is, of course, the commission of investigation into the mother and baby homes. And it has been front and centre in a lot of the news headlines this week. Surprisingly for some, for the reasons that they might not totally understand. Of course, going into this, it is accepted that the mother and baby homes commission is a very emotional, a very emotive subject to talk about. It comes with a lot of anger, pain, suspicion and distrust, uh, especially for those who have been directly affected by it. The commission, in terms of giving you, giving you guys a background into what it when it was set up, it was set up about five years ago. Uh, it was off the back of the discovery of nearly 800 bodies in a septic tank in Tume. You know, that is a, a horrific find for anybody, and I think anybody of who has any um, empathy can appreciate, you know, this is a lot of questions for every body that we found, how many bodies didn't we find? Problem with these homes and, and these institutes, and I don't like using the word home because when we're talking about this story, I, I am conscious that for a lot of people, and I know it's not everybody, but surely a home should be a place of safety, of warmth, of love, and, and, I, and I appreciate that not everybody's home is that. When you describe these as mother and baby homes, it gives an idea that, you know, it's a safe of, a place of sanctuary, a safe, uh, safe place to be, a, a, a place that was full of warmth and care and, uh, and, and so on. But surely these, as the report and, and as the anecdotes have come out from the survivors, that these weren't homes. And I think using the word home when talking about this is something that is uh, um, incorrect, is wrong, because these are institutions for a vast majority of them, uh, for, for the vast majority of them run by charities and religious groups. And, and we know in more recent times the relationship between the state and the governing of the state over these these in religious institutes and uh, and charities and as much as they were government institutions they were very there was very little oversight from from the government uh, and government bodies from the founding of the state back in 20, 1921 to 22 uh, up to, to as, as recent as uh, 22 years ago in 1998 these, these in institutes have been running and you know from doing a little bit of research into the mother and babies uh, scandal as, as as it's known as uh, and what goes on in it um, I wasn't I'll be totally honest up, up to date with it but as I w was reading different things across the week and coming across different articles and, and looking further into it for, for the podcast it was um, it's quite harrowing some of the detail and, and some of the stuff that's going on but Everybody who's been t speaking about it has been speaking about it in, in, and are of the same opinion. It was it was a terrible a travesty that happened to these people and these families. But I think in terms of how the story have developed in the news media, over it was the it, it was the ceiling uh, as they're calling it uh, of the findings of the report and, and and the detail. Now, in terms of what should happen or shouldn't happen, the commission's job really is uh, really was. Uh, over the past five years is to delve in terms in, in depth in terms of trying to find as much information from anybody who was involved be it uh, or people who worked there people who are in, in terms of areas of responsibility and then obviously the people who had been how was the best way to describe this when i using the word in, inmates and um, survivors of, of these institutes and again i'm not using the word home so the commission was given the terms of reference they went off and and they found over 60,000 records and this is why these commissions of investigations take so long and I think there was 18 in total of these institutes that they got in, in, in contact with and 
of those 18, 15 of them had supplied records and three of them somehow had no records available. As well as the record finding and going through all the paperwork, over 500 people were, gave their own personal account to the commission. And this is where kind of the the problem starts. You know, under the investigation, the commission of investigation, a lot of these people will be coming forward and they would be giving or regaling their stories in the sense of what happened to them and, and, and like anything it wasn't under it wasn't being challenged it was being accepted to be what it was it was their recollection of events that have happened in the past and the purpose of the commission is to bring to light the stories of these people and what happened in these institutes and this is where we're going to this is where the, the, the main problem came up later in the week in terms of the sealing of the records you know and it's all about now the new in the new jargon that we're using the gdpr the data commissioner you know this is all coming into it and, and the row really began you know with Roderick o'gorman and um, the green the green party td and the minister for, for responsibility for this area uh getting getting involved and in some of the comments that he made you know um the report obviously is to be delivered and um, it has thousands of pages in it it's very detailed the commission is set up set up under an act that was written uh, agreed to in 2004 a part of this a part of this um act states in it that any commission of investigation findings and data is sealed off there for 30 years following that now this is to allow people to give in honestly information across the commission without feeling that they're going to be prejudiced that they can be challenged on it uh, and cause you know further um further emotional distress for these people because they've gone through enough as it is um, and the ministers then went and said that it may be possible to transfer the databases and the records from the commission into another government body um, Tusla. Now the problem with that is one of the biggest findings and one of the biggest things that we learned from the mother and baby scandal is that there is a lot of mistrust around the survivors of this in terms of what the government do and government bodies do. So giving it from one other government body to another government body in their eyes can be seen to be a little bit of pointlessness. Tuesday might not be trusted. I have no I have I have no idea in terms of what the general public think of Tuesday, but I can understand from a predisposition from not trusting government bodies how survivors of this might not want their personal data uh, be given across. In terms of the law, in terms of the, the Act of 2004, which doesn't give a huge amount of direction, it's quite grey in terms of sharing data. Obviously, with new laws that came back in, and I think it was 2018, in terms of GDPR, the sharing of data, does it contradict the, uh, the laws that are already in state? And this is where the Commissioner came in. We have to consider all of these facts and and this is kind of where the argument came up you know in terms of who is right and who has a right to access this information I, I i am aware that you know there is a database there of all of the information that has been allowed it has now been sealed and won't be able to be um, touched by anybody re realistically for the next 30 years some of this information might be be able to be shared with other government government departments but a lot of the information is given across in confidence and a lot of the stuff is not necessarily trusted in terms of the records because we know from this from some of, from some of the anecdotes that come out is that a lot of the records were manipulated because there was a degree of um, selling of children from these uh, homes to Amer rich american families in terms of adoption and it's very difficult for people to um, ascertain who the people were where the where the people are now and also in terms of trying to identify trying to identify where you came from as a survivor of this i suppose is also um difficult because if you want to go and track and trace down your biological mother and father you know the supreme court has recently upheld the right to not be traced so does all this kind of to and and fro and who's right and who's wrong and and you know it's a case of a lot of people are saying the government is just sweeping stuff under the carpet now with this ceiling of the findings of this uh, commission of investigation but it passed in the doll 78 to 67 you know the whip wasn't forced which you, you can have your own arguments on that should it have been a free and conscious vote interestingly all the amendments put forward by the opposition parties were refused and in terms of my own opinion and, and giving my own perspective i think it is a line in the sand in terms of 
the government's response they want to kind and i think i agree with sweeping under the carpet i think it is a case of that but we have the balance up between what people are entitled to in terms of a commission of investigation do we have to revisit what are the terms of a commission of investigation in terms of sealing it for 30 years is it in contradiction to gdpr rules that we have now in place um, and these will all have to be fleshed out in the coming weeks and months i'm pretty sure I think also that we have to be aware that government ministers need to speak and be conscious of when they're speaking, the ramifications of what they say. And Roderick O'Gorman, I'm sure he's a fine person, but maybe he's a little bit uh, wet behind the ears when it comes to political engagement. I, I don't know. him. Maybe some of the stuff that he said may have been ill judged, and I hope he takes away from this and as people make mistakes, uh, they have to learn from it. So I think that was one of the more emotional stories and a very hard story for us as a nation to confront especially in the times that we're living in we need to appreciate what happened in our past and acknowledge what happened in our past and take measures that make sure that this never happens again and um, heaven forbid anything like this was to happen or is happening in its society that it definitely and 100 percent needs to be snuffed out in a week when the entire country went from level three to level five lockdown. I want to kind of maybe over the next few minutes flesh out and compare the situation we find ourselves now in level five as compared to level five back in or lockdown. We didn't have levels back then. Lockdown back in spring. And I suppose there is a definitely, I don't know about you, a definite div um, difference between this level five and the last level five or lockdown one compared to lockdown 2.0 came into effect on the 22nd of October at midnight. Now, is that the 22nd or the 23rd? I'd ask Leo Bradcar. He didn't seem to be. But in all honesty, why didn't they just pick six o'clock on a Thursday morning? Would have got all that ambiguity. It's last for six weeks on the recommendation of Neffet. It was the second letter that Neffet sent. The letter argued from Neffet that, you know, a three week lockdown isn't going to work. A six week lockdown is going to be more effective. Neffet also recommended or suggested that there was no need to close the schools and I'll get into that one later on because I think it's important one just to, to beef out a little bit a little bit different obviously this lockdown means we can't go out five out, outside of five kilometer radius again and this time there is penalties uh, and implications for doing so there was a little bit of the easing of the restrictions in terms of going by the government's living with uh, COVID uh, framework the level five obviously the weddings were supposed to be down to six um, there was an opportunity that schools might and creches might close and that households couldn't uh, engage with each other. Under this uh, lockdown, level uh, lockdown 2.0 or level 5, um, there is an introduction of the social bubble. So if you're alone or if you're a single parent, you can partner or pair up with another, another household. So there's a level of engagement. So they're trying to address, and in fairness, it's a difficult one to manage the... Um, loneliness factor or the social isolation which has negatively affected on society in the last seven seven and a half months getting back to Neffet's recommendation obviously it's the second letter it's this two weeks after they initially uh, leaked it or, or suggested it to the government the government then put a the plans in place and i spoke last week about the fact that the government uh, took forever to uh, create leadership but Michal martin on Taoiseach came out and he spoke uh, to to the nation uh, and we and then we had a pref conference and then we went into lockdown at 48 hours after that at that speech but i think you know there's there's a lot of cogs in this wheel and lockdown in, involves a lot of sacrifice by a lot of people but i think personally the big difference is that the schools are going to be staying open at the moment when we're having this um, podcast uh, broadcasting this podcast but the way the schools rolled in behind uh, and this is where the unions and i'm no problem with unions everybody's entitled to membership for union but the way they rolled in and, and they kind of tried to um you know say that people didn't value teachers and people didn't un understand the um, the risks that teachers were taking i think was a little bit uncharacteristic uh, of the goodwill that's going around in this country and and in terms of that goodwill it's it's a lot less than it was back in springtime um, there's a le level of diver d division within society in terms of who should be staying open, who should be traveling where. And, and it's obvious I've, I've been out doing my shopping and, and I've seen bookstores open. I've seen 
Um, I've seen vaping stores open uh, and, and I do question some of the stores that I see open being opened um, and I appreciate that people want to stay in work and, and that's fine but in terms of the idea behind level five it's reduce our social exposure in terms of people that we're coming in contact with if there is too many places for us to go and too many places for us to congregate then that is ill-advised and against uh, NEFID recommendations but I think the big thing about the teachers is them, you know, threatening that the, the, there's a possibility that when we come back from the midterm break after Halloween, that schools may not be in a position to um, facilitate uh, the opening of schools is is is, is ill judged, and I think teachers will lose a lot of brownie points that they built up with, uh, with with the general public over the last seven months. I think a lot of people and a lot of parents would have appreciated the le the level of work involved in schooling and schooling um, their children. That they may not have previously uh, appreciated that does not mean to say that um they don't want their kids back in school of course they do and we want all of our kids and the the, the up and coming generations to have access to education as we all have had uh, coming up ourselves um, but i think the unions just need to re revisit their position in terms of how they're uh, addressing their members and try not to uh, create division where we don't need division we need unity uh, in in the community at the moment uh, and this is ill advised i would say of course with lockdown too there was a huge amount of jobs being lost as not as many as i i think in the last lockdown uh, but i think the figure is 150,000 six weeks six weeks of pup or pandemic unemployment payments and new four four graded system of the ewss uh, or the employer's wage subsidy scheme um, which I think is 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 welcomed amongst us, uh, the sector, um, but I, one thing that came out of the lockdown, uh, new lockdown restrictions, is the approach by Angarda Shikana, and kind of the level of fines that are going to be in place. And I think at the time of of this recording that the the fines will be coming into place. And there has been you know different people again, different people in society saying different things and different interpretations of what. What has been said, um, fines of 500 euro if you breach your five kilometers. Uh, if you're a repeat offense of two or three times, you have a uh, face imprisonment and up to 2,500 fine. The commissioner, then, the guard commissioner, pardon me, came out and said, you know, this is an area of last resort. We don't want to do this policing by force. We want to do it by consent. And I think that's a great approach in terms of what we got in the last round and Irish people are very, you know, obliging of the of the police in, in the most part. I know we saw scuffles in Grafton Street uh, during the week and that was unsightly and unwelcome. The 11 people arrested. As a community, we need to come together and that would be my message across, you know, we all are in this together and as much as it is hard and as hard as it is, we just need to come together, do the right things, reduce our circle of uh, social contacts, do stay indoors as much as we can. The weather isn't as great as it has been in the summer, so it's a little bit easier. And then obviously don't have house parties. Now there was a, a little bit of a, a laugh going around that you know you'd have guards knocking at your door if you were having a house party, but as long as you didn't answer the door, the guard couldn't enforce the law. Now obviously that is as as true as that might be. The guard can then still wait for people to leave the house. They're not going to stay there for six weeks. Uh, so there is a level of of laughter behind that. The guards still can enforce stuff. They don't necessarily have to be in the premises to give you direction. If you refuse direction of a guard, then you can be penalised. The minister, sorry, the, the commissioner came out and kind of argued against what the, the, the guard and inspectors um, representatives of saying that they couldn't enforce the new legislation or the new rules. I think they can realistically if the will is there by Angarnashi Akana. Finally, I think the biggest non-story non of lockdown 2.0 at the moment is the uh, Virapro or the hand sanitizer or hand gel blew up on Thursday night, Friday morning when schools who were using this hand sanitizer were told that they needed to uh, remove this hand sanitizer and if they didn't have any sub substitute hand sanitizer that they needed to close down for the day or go midterm early. I think that was a non-story. I know people are trying to build it up that the uh, Department of Agriculture knew about this on Tuesday, didn't report until Thursday evening and caused the pandemic. This is a, a storm in a teacup. Yes, the hand gel was causing dermatitis. Yes, the hand gel might cause headaches and breathing difficulties, but not in a case of it was life-threatening, you know? So we just need to get a little level of perspective. The hand sanitizer didn't work. The kids got off of school a day early okay we need to ask questions of the procurement process in terms of who knew what about in terms of that but in the great scheme of things the kids getting off a day early in a couple of schools no big deal 
Finally, and probably the shorter story, but still one that was trending quite heavily on, in our news blogs uh, and news feeds this week was, of course, the final presidential debate, which, in my opinion, will probably have no effect on the uh, presidential election because a lot of the people in America have already voted. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway or the biggest learnings with this is that Trump was a little bit more muted, mainly because he has threatened that he would basically be muted by the host he was restrained he was muzzled if you want um, and you know what I think Trump's opinion and, his, and people who are feeding him information will probably tell him this is not a bad thing Donald let Biden chat away say as much as he wants because he'll walk himself into a, a, a pitfall which in fairness to Biden on reflection and looking back over it a second time Biden avoided any any slip ups he avoided any pitfalls he, speaking probably less than I thought he would have you know he was Biden was seen as the grown up for the White House and Trump, you know, seen as the man without a plan, I think is the best way to describe Donald Trump. He's got sound bites. He kind of, he was preaching to the converted already. He was appealing to his base. I think Biden was more set, more of appealing to the middle America. Maybe he was appealing more to the undecided. And it, I think it's possible to say that, you know, this did more good for Biden than it did harm to Trump um, because Trump wasn't able to come across as crass, as as sullen, as as negative as he normally would be. There was a possibility that Biden w w wouldn't be seen uh, as positive. Another takeaway was, you know, Trump's um, opinion or, or comment that he was the best president for Black Lives Matter community in America it was a bit weird. You do, I find Trump entertaining. But some of the stuff you just have to scratch your head at it sometimes. And um, it is possible that at this moment in time, I think there was up to 50, maybe 60 million people have already voted in America. And obviously they use the, the college system in America in terms of votes. So if Biden wins, he might still lose the election. My problem with this whole thing, right, as an observer from the outside, is that there's 400 million people living in America. And they all they can find to put up in terms of leadership is two men in their 70s. Now, there's nothing wrong with being in your 70s, but the two men in their 70s, you know, realistically, one is a, a journeyed, you know, gravy train politician, Joe Biden. I'm not saying he hasn't done a lot, but he's been in the system for nearly 50 years. And a TV personality who is out for his own goals. Two of them don't necessarily serve the best uh, needs for American nation, especially in a time when they need a man or a woman with a plan, and um, with a sense of how where we're going to be in four years' time, where we're going to be in eight years' time. And I think, in terms of the Democratic and the Republican Party, they need to look inwards in terms of the people that they're attracting into their party, what their party stands for. Are they going to extreme? Do we need to come back to the middle in terms of getting everybody on the same train? And it's an opportunity, I think, in terms of if Donald Trump wins, then you know you're going to get a new president in four years' time, regardless of what happens. Please, God, we'll be in a better situation. Or if we get Joe Biden in, realistically, Joe might only stand for four years, and then it's a, it's a, it's a chance for the, the Democratic Party to get fresh blood and for the Republican Party to get fresh blood in. So yeah, it, it's it's going to be an interesting week ahead of us. Um, hopefully, we will be speaking of an ease of transition into a, a, a new uh, administration. Perhaps not, but either way, it's going to be an interesting week ahead. And those were the three main stories that I feel dominated this week in Ireland. First of all, uh, and, and probably most important of all, the, the Commission of Investigation into the Mother and Homes uh, Institute bill. Um and all the fallout and ramifications and the managing and that by the government. Secondly, the movement from level three to level five of the nation in terms of restrictions under the rebuild, uh, living with COVID structure for the government and the fallout and the comparison between that and springtime lockdown. And finally, the presidential debate during the week and the likelihood that it will have no major effect on the outcome of the election because Donald Trump was appealing to the people who he already has on side and a lot of people up to 55 60 million people have already voted through the postal service those are the stories now i'm going to introduce ashling farrell my friend from dcu we are friends nearly over 12 years and earlier on this week with thanks to zoom airlines as we all know it now i sat down and had a chat with her and this is what it sounded like Hello and welcome to the Big Nose Podcast. This week, my very special guest, 10,000 kilometres away, 
in sunny by the background South Africa is Ashling Farrell or now I suppose Keevney Ashling Keevney or what I, how would you say it in Irish? Yeah that's right Keevney. Keevney you're very welcome to the big nose. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Ah you know it's a international podcast now you see so I'm getting everybody yeah. I'm tapping into family in Australia next, and you never know where this podcast might go. Um, I suppose, in terms of ourselves, we know each other nearly, without giving away our age, about 12 years, I think it is, getting on 12 yeah, years now. 12 years. We met in DCU all those years ago with a, a load of other great people, and um, little did we know, 12 years later, we'd still be very good friends, and uh, even though there might be continents between us. I suppose, um, in terms of where you are, you're, you're now in... South Africa, you're, you're always rambling around the world, but at this very moment in time when we find ourselves, you're in South Africa, and I suppose a lot of the listeners want to know why you're in South Africa, or what has you in South Africa? Well, it's, yeah, as you say, I ramble around the world a good bit. Um, I first came to Africa when I was 23. I moved to Ghana for an internship in Accra, in the capital there, and worked at an advertising agency um, for the summer, and it's sort of Africa just kind of captured my heart and I've always been kind of trying to find ways to come back and sort of permanently or more long term. So I did spend a bit of time in Morocco after that. And when last year the opportunity came up to move to Cape Town, I grabbed it and yeah, have been here kind of on and off since then. You know, I had to get the my visa organized and things like that. But yeah, An easy process, uh, I imagine the visa. Oh, very easy, yeah. Done in two two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, fill in a few boxes, <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, you're very welcome to South Africa. We, we we welcome you with open arms. I suppose as you as you kind of yeah. al- alluded to, you, and I I said to you, I, and I always say to my friends uh, and anybody when I'm talking about it, you never know what you're never sure where where Ashley is going to be in the world. And as, as you alluded to, you're in, in Ghana, and you it obviously isn't the first time you've been outside of, of your hometown of Roscommon, I suppose. You've been around in different places. Yeah, so I, um, as you mentioned, I moved, I went to Roscommon, left Roscommon to go to DCU when I was 18. The two summers after that, I spent in the States um, doing the kind of J1 visa thing that... Oh, yeah, working. You know, so back then I thought... Working, sort of, yeah. Yeah, I thought all 18-year-old Irish people do this, but the people in Dublin were kind of looking at me like, what? What are you talking about? Because they obviously had things to do for the summer in Dublin and uh, <laughs> didn't need to go so far afield. Visa that you could get. And back then it was very easy to get. You just kind of applied for it, paid the fee and off you went. But now I think that's been... I think Trump um, a, has, bit, has you know? kind of gone back on the, the, the J-1 visa. He doesn't want... He, well, he doesn't generally want anybody who is an American in, in America. So even if you're Irish and have built up that country going back in its history it, it still doesn't want you over there for the summer I suppose taking summer jobs away from Americans who could take them this is the thing so it's uh, you kind of have to now have a job at, arranged in advance and pay you know extortionate amounts which students obviously can't afford and you can, how can they get a job in advance if they don't know anyone over there um, so I don't know if it's going to become a thing of the past but I was lucky enough that I got to do it back then yeah, um, it's so kind of, it was for a lot a lot of people a rite of passage. I know my dad went over in nineteen oh let me get this right eighty one, and did a year over in yeah nineteen eighty one. I think he was seventeen or eighteen, and did a year there. He actually graduated from Coachella Valley School in South uh, California. Um, he did high school for a year and he graduated from that. So I think the the relationship with Ireland and America has always been very positive. In recent years, with different administrations coming online, Trump being the main one, he kind of has dismantled a lot of that, and a lot of that work has been undone. And as you said, you went and did it. It wasn't something that ever was on my radar. I I did a German exchange student. I suppose that's how we met. We ended up in DCU together doing European business in German, um, and a big part of that obviously was spending quite a period of time in Germany. And how was Germany for those two years? Well, that was I had just turned twenty, and I suppose same for you when we moved there but when I went I didn't plan to spend my whole 20s there but I did you know I left just before I turned 29 last year so um that's just sort of I don't know why or how but it happened so yeah it was it was good I really liked um really liked living in Germany my favorite thing there was just the language 
and getting to learn a different language because, you know, at the start it was completely a fish out of water. I don't have a clue. I can't, you know, I need to order a pillow so I can actually sleep at night. I have no idea what the word for pillow is. So I'm trying to mime pillow, which how do you mime that yeah. in the shop? And, you and know, feeling you're a right idiot, that. I suppose, at the same time. Yeah, and you were going around different parts of Germany. One moment you were in Frankfurt, the next you were in Hamburg, and, and you kind of got this got the whole the whole three sixty experience, I suppose, of, of Germany as as a country. Yeah. So the only the kind of hardest part was that people there overall are a lot different to Irish. You know, they're a bit more reserved and kind of you know, if you're a stranger, why are you talking to me? We're kind of you know, I don't we don't know each other. Whereas in Ireland, you can't walk down the road with someone ask, uh, without someone asking you. What do you do and where are you go and how's the weather and everything so that was hard to get used to and i never really got used to it no i think and yeah was... i think that's where even this podcast kind of developed as a nation we're a nosy nation we like knowing other people's business and if we have to say hello to them to start them to tell me what's going on in their lives then we'll say hello and see where it goes from there yeah yeah and whether they like it or not they'll get a bit of an inquisition absolutely the thousand <laughs> questions and you wouldn't even know them from adam but but in the we- most well-intentioned way ever. So I kind of missed that when I was yeah, uh, it, when I was gone. It was a culture shock, I, I can well imagine. I suppose looking to where you are now and looking at that beautiful background, is it Table Mountain behind you? Yeah, Table Mountain and Signal Hill. Yeah, well, I suppose when I... When, oh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I suppose when I think of yeah. South Africa, I think of... Obviously, you think of maybe special people like maybe Nelson Mandela you think of Robben Island, you think of the history of apartheid, you think of a great rugby nation um, and stuff like that. I suppose in terms of yourself, in terms of your own expectations going over, what were you expecting before you went over to South Africa to, to be like? What did you expect to come across, I suppose? Um, well, I suppose overall I kind of usually go into things without having many expectations. So because I say, well, I don't know what it's going to be like, so I'll just go and see. I didn't think it was going to be as kind of westernized in a European sense as it is. So mm. obviously the British were here and the Dutch were here and they have left a lasting impact. So in many ways, it's more similar to Ireland than Germany was, just in terms of people and their kind of personalities, the brands of things that you can buy here. Um, it was a lot, It's a lot more wealthy in some parts than I would have even imagined. I mean, there's mansions overlooking the ocean and incredible things. Um, but then also the poverty is worse than I imagined as well. You know, other people just have a corrugated piece of tin tilt up into a tent to sleep in. Um, so it's very, I know it's, you kind of know from uh, history and just learning about it that it's very unequal, but it's really... It's really polarised in yeah, a sense yeah, and, and so extreme. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, that I could have imagined before. I like what you said there. I like the, your approach that you were saying, like going in somewhere, you know, not having any, trying to bring in any baggage or preconceived ideas of a place is something that not everybody's able to do because obviously we're in a world where we are surrounded by information. Google is at our fingertips a lot of the time. So it might be, you know, a prerequisite or a pre, uh, predetermined that you might go and see what's going to happen and, and what, what I am expecting. But it's it's great to see, I suppose, from going around and traveling as much as you have, it probably has broadened your eyes to say, well, there's no point in going in here and going in with a closed mind. We might as well be open to it as much as possible. I suppose then you've been there now a period, a good period of time, I suppose. Um, what's the reality? Because I know you've spoken to me uh, over whatsapp and, and different things and you're able to get me sometimes depending on the level of internet what's the reality of living in south africa so yeah did say so it changes a lot so when when i first got here they had just emerged from a drought so they were you know counting down to day zero where they're going to cut the water off there would be no water coming out of the taps you'd have to queue up no matter rich or poor, to collect water and bring it home to use. So it was very, you know, water conservation and people really did um, knuckle down and they did it, you know, they were really careful, they limited themselves. So they did avoid day zero, at least here in the Western Cape. But they do still have a lot of problems with electricity. So the ESCOM is the national, you know, kind of equivalent of ESB sort of thing. But they just have so many problems. Um, Sounds like the ESPI. Maintaining stable electricity <laughs> And it's not, not because, you know, a storm happened or anything. It's just that they, 
you know, one day they'd say, oh, the coal got wet, so we have to cut off the electricity, or, you know, there was a fire at one of the plants, so we have to cut it off. Um, so, yeah, there was, a long, there was a long few months where every day the power was being cut for at least two hours, and sometimes in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening, and they kind of had a timetable, but, you know, they didn't go by the timetable, so you'd be trying to plan, okay, I can do my work and my cooking and everything in these hours, and then it would just suddenly turn off, and, you know, in winter especially, which we're just coming out of winter now, it's coming into summer, but it was really cold, and kind of, you couldn't have your heater on. Or just get the iron jumper out. Just get the extra iron jumper out. You'd be, you'd be sorted. Oh, exactly. The, the few iron jumpers and the job was good. Absolutely. <laughs> well, a woman like yourself so, should have yeah. plenty of those uh, uh, hanging around the apartment or house yeah. or whatever. A follow on question from that, you know, you've been, you've been there now. You've, you've kind of, the reality is become your new normal as this phrase has been banded about a lot now. For yourself, what's been on a personal level the biggest adjustment you've made? You've had to make. You know, has it been a case if you had to find a new brand of tea, or you know? Well, it's funny you should say that. The biggest adjustment is that you can't buy Maltesers here, which is my biggest comfort food. What? I would eat a family-sized bag of Maltesers on a bad day or on a good day. It depends on your point of view, but <laughs> they just don't have them. So if you're ever if you're ever passing this way, feel free to bring an extra suitcase full of them. Yeah, you can always get those. You can, you can always get those in the airport. You know those mega-sized bags of Maltesers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I didn't plan that until it was an emergency. It was too late to go back to the airport in Dublin, so I was regretting it. In a serious, a more serious note is you know being outside as kind of a white foreigner is kind of dangerous because you are seen as wealthy and we basically are wealthy compared to the average here so you, you know you can't wear jewelry you can't show that you have a phone or a wallet or anything you have to kind of try to keep them hidden walk fast look like you know where you're going do know where you're going but actually you do have to have the phone because you have to call for help so it's um you know, and nothing, so I've been, yeah, it's been over a year and a half since I first moved here and nothing too terrible in that regard has happened, but you are conscious of it because you have to be, yeah, and it will be, yeah. you know, very irresponsible not to have it in mind, which just was not the case in Germany and was not the case in Ireland. Of course, so it's, it's, it's quite... it, you're learning of a new sense of self-awareness, I suppose, of where you're at or who's look at, who's around you or, or where you want to go and what's the best way to go and, and you know, what and and planning for those unfortunate incidents that you know thank god haven't happened but you know i always have to always have the possibility of happening in the situation that you are in i suppose as you said you've, you've moved over there about a year and a half ago one thing that a lot of people talk about when you're away is the feeling of missing family and, and you quite you have quite a lot of siblings your mum and dad at home as well and, and a large family and i suppose the feeling of homesickness and and how you manage that i know you've obviously traveled around the world and from from knowing you and knowing your family a lot of you is like moving away and, and moving around and, and being as far away as from Roscommon as as physically possible for a lot of the time and, and god help your mother and father but the feeling of homesickness and missing in the family i suppose how do you manage that because it's not a case of you're in germany now where you can fly home in two hours it's quite a commitment getting home from where you are now yeah so that's right i I've never really had homesickness because I kind of feel like wherever I am, I'm at home. But I do miss my family um, all the time and friends at home. But now we're so connected, you know, and as you say, I have um, five siblings and I have my mom and dad. So if I feel homesick, you know, I can ring one of them and one of them will pick up the phone and I can, we can have a chat and a laugh and just feel connected again so that kind of assuages the feeling a bit but it's true that once lockdown so lockdown kind of started I think on 27th of March year where they totally banned any flights out or in for any reason or anything like that so I suddenly felt very at the distance and that you know in Germany you could say oh this one weekend this month I'll hop on an Aer Lingus flight you know it'll be less than 100 euro I'll be home from Friday to, to Sunday I can be back to work on Monday here, it's more like you have to save up, you know, it's more like at least 500 euro and, you know, kind of 14 hours and changeovers and layovers. And that's if you're even allowed legally to leave. So it did feel very, there was a sort of momentary panic of, oh my gosh, I'm trapped here. When will I be home? When will I see them again? 
yeah, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of calmed down, but now things are opening and easing here, if not there. But we're managing, and we know we will all be back together um, at some point. Probably not this Christmas, but by next Christmas, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Uh, so, yeah, so I don't know. I don't really do anything to manage it, except to keep in contact with them more when I feel that. Yeah, I suppose it's a case more. of um, checking in from time to time and, and you know, Obviously, I, I imagine there's a family WhatsApp group or whatever, or, or, or uh, you know, yeah. you know. And, and so, uh, like you mentioned, with Roscommon, it's not just that we are all leaving Roscommon. There's just not that much employment for people of our age. So even all my friends and so on of our generation also live further, a lot further afield. So it's not like if I was there, I'd see them all every day. No, yeah, kind you, of quite the contrary. You have to spread your wings sometimes. So, Especially, you know, as you said, you know, if you want employment, you want, you want work, you have to go where the work is. You can't always stay, stay at home and it, because it's not always there for you. I've met your mum a few times. Uh, I've spoken to her about, you know, always gallivanting off. But I suppose, how does your, how does your, how does your family react to your decision to say, okay, this is it. I'm off to South Africa. Well, I think they thought I was under coercion and being kidnapped or something first, um, because my mom had kind of, you know, she knows, she has some colleagues who are nurses and things like that who are South African and they've kind of escaped to Ireland and they're telling her, you know, the economy is so bad, everything's so bad, it's so dangerous. And this is pre-COVID, so there's other layers to that now. <laughs> um, and so she'd be, you know, Googling it, reading the news for here and seeing, you know, it's kind of like one of the most dangerous cities in the world and things like that, which is true statistically, but it depends on the area you're in, you know. Uh, Johannesburg is worse than Cape Town the townships are worse than the city things like that yeah it's like at so home so she was very worried and like really didn't like the idea at first but she knew well she hoped I'd be kind of sensible and knew best what to do for myself and my dad is always more like oh sure you know whatever hopefully you'll be back for in the next big party or wedding or Christmas or something. Yeah, a, a, little, a little bit easy, got more yeah, easy going. Yeah, so I think they were worried. But now that I've been here this long and I'm always giving them positive reports of everything, they are a bit more relaxed. So I'm hoping to get them out here one of these years for like a nice tour so they can see that I'm not just pretending it's all roses. But yeah, it well, I suppose when when you're going for a holiday, it's different than going yeah, going, going to live. Still, I think it would help them to see how like nice the neighborhood is and how nice the people are and just yeah, because I think you can only explain in so many words what an area is like or how something is. You can only yeah. if you want yeah. to know something. Sometimes the best thing you can do is is go and experience it. The great thing about being Irish is that we get everywhere, uh, as your family can testament to. Um, but we always set up routes or you know we set up kind of Irish pubs is how we, we go, go around the world trying to dominate but is there a big Irish um, community I suppose yeah so I can't believe how many connections and how many people from Ireland or connected to Ireland that I've met I think the best the best was when uh, a week after I moved here in March 2019 it was St. Patrick's Day and so kind of said there's this event on in this hotel you know will i bother going to it or not but i said sure we'll see we might meet people here and so didn't have you know was getting tickets kind of late in the day so there was only sort of standing tickets left and other people were all seated you know having kind of bacon and cabbage dinner and irish dancers were up on stage and stuff like this older two older ladies kind of said oh sure can't sit here there's free seats our friends aren't coming so sat beside them and they said you know where are you from and what are you doing and all that and it turned out the the lady was from roscommon and her father had retired from work the day my father started so my dad knew her dad who has since passed away because she's in her 70s now and I thought, Jesus, I've been here a week and now there's someone from down the road at home who my whole family know. <laughs> there's no way, you can't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere. Finish. No, I think <laughs> as a nation, I think I, I was I was over in the States one time. I came across a lad who lived two two roads away from me. Like it's it's such a small. And even when we went to Germany, that one of the lads who owned the Irish bar, he uh, he grew up uh, Barry around the corner from me. So it doesn't matter where we go in this in this in this little <laughs> planet of ours that um we can't we can't find people that we know or, or knows our family i suppose speaking about 
are going around the world and, and obviously at the moment no one's going anywhere really. COVID-19 as is happening at this moment is being moved to the highest level in Ireland. Um, we're going into winter, um, you're going into summer I think or, or, or spring or whatever. Yeah. Um, so you're going into that and you're coming out of lockdown I suppose. In terms of COVID-19, how has it affected South Africa as a country uh, and I suppose what have South Africa's and South Africans' response been to? Well, they had one of the strictest lockdowns in the world, or the kind of harshest ones, and it went on for quite a long time. And once it started, you know, there was no getting around. It was very, very strict. So for about six weeks, you couldn't leave your house, even for exercise. So you could go to get groceries or to get medical care, but you couldn't just go for a run or be walking about outside. Um, and then once, so that was level five, and that lasted for six weeks. And then after that, level four, you could go outside from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. to do exercise, which kind of was a bit nonsensical because it meant everyone was out on the streets at the same time, like running into each other, trying to get their exercise in. Ah. Whereas, yeah, but, you know, so even our neighborhood is so quiet, and you'd never hardly bump, uh, bump into anyone or meet anyone maybe, you know, five people if you were walking around for yeah. an hour. But suddenly everyone was out, you know, jogging with the prams and with the running and with everything. So they didn't really think that part through, I think. Um, and then, yeah, so it slowly eased up from since then. And now we're, we're at level one, which is kind of most things are allowed, except there's restrictions on opening hours for restaurants and um, so on. But... So, yeah, so the debate is still raging over whether this was justified, whether they should have done it, whether it was the best thing, because they rely so heavily on tourism in Cape Town. Of course, yeah. It's, you know, a massive, massive part of the industry and the income, and also the people who are in, you know, kind of in poverty and things like that also rely on that because they get odd jobs or they can even just get some donations or begging so a lot of people now kind of with the benefit of hindsight say that it was not the best decision because they did more so much da so much damage to the economy kind of caused people to be starving and it's so yeah, much more the, the social the so, social impact was it was too too severe in terms of the balance between yeah. the need to yeah. shut everything down i suppose in the healthcare point of view the social impacts and the and the, and the the knock on effects and the lasting effects that it had on society and I think mm -hmm. I think the same was said here I suppose in terms of you know in Ireland and I don't know how much you've been able to stay keep abreast of everything in Ireland but like we went into a lockdown fairly early doors we kind of sacrificed the economy for the sake of life and health and it went on and it went on and now we kind of came back out of lockdown towards the end of the summer. And now we're seeing the knock on effects of, you know, too much freedom. And tonight, I think the Taoiseach, Mike, Michal Martin, is going to announce that basically we're going back into level five or the most restricted lockdown, with the exception of schools being staying open and construction work staying open. But for me, the biggest, the, the lucky, lucky side for me is that I'm still working and I still have a routine and I can get out of the house in the morning, come home and I have work and, and that's great but I suppose in terms of yourself and all these restrictions how did it affect you well I suppose I hadn't really built up a life here yet you know so yeah. I had just got here um I just got back I remember you leaving months. on the train on the plane masked up ready to go and I yeah so I just got back here and and I was locked in so I kind of yeah it was weird it was like being in this bubble and you know so with amazing views which is looking so kind of a balcony these amazing sunsets and sunrise and weather but you couldn't go out into it to enjoy it so it was kind of like the nicest prison ever um you know it was fine I had all my books had all my stuff to do but you know it would have been nice to step outside and actually enjoy it so it was yeah and i suppose as well on, on, a, on a personal level you did celebrate a not so insignificant birthday during yeah. during that lockdown i suppose which obviously you may have had larger plans 
for what you might have wanted sure. to do, but... For my 30th well, um, in April, April then, not me. I had thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a nightclub in Cape Town for the first time and kind of go into the city centre for a night out, you know, what it's all about, and that was swiftly uh, removed from the equation, so... <laughs> Just in in my living room with a rice crispy cake. <laughs> that was the salvage. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. It was me a month later here, basically. Parking the negativity of COVID-19 and what it is, I suppose, looking into the future and our crystal ball, as I keep saying to people, for 2021 um, and a COVID-free society. What do you think um, it will hold for you? The, the only plan is to be able to stay here. So get the visa, kind of sort out the long-term visa um be able to do so we you know i haven't been to robin island yet because that was also locked down and still is just get you know settle in here you know but really this year has been really good for me on a personal level it's you know obviously not been a good good year globally but it has been a very happy year and very content and this place is so beautiful if i can stay here and be allowed to work and live and hike and gallivant well this is it yeah uh, it's, a, it's really, you know, I don't have any further plans. I think what it has changed is that I don't plan to go back to Europe. I don't plan to travel anywhere. I just want to be here and enjoy the moment all the time because it's, it's very enjoyable. And stay in the present, I suppose. Uh, That's the kind of... Yeah. It's and I think a takeaway from... Stay in the present, yeah. appreciate it, being healthy, being happy is huge. And it's basically everything, all you need. I suppose, Ashlyn, that's, that's, that's all the questions that I have for you. Um, I want to thank you for joining me on the big nose. I just one last question. Any Afrikaans? Oh, well, yeah. So Afrikaans is quite close to German. So I can understand it well enough. But they have 11 official languages here. And they're considering Adna 12, so it should be South African Sign Language, which I don't oh, know why good. that's not already on the list. Yeah, but should be there. So the one that I'm trying to learn is Kosa, where they click while they're speaking and singing. Yeah, Kosa. And then there's Zulu and Afrikaans. So Afrikaans you is... You couldn't have picked the like easy one to learn, no? Mixture of no, no. <laughs> it wouldn't Boring. Be, wouldn't be you. <laughs> so next time we'll do the in- an interview, it can be in Kosa. Absolutely, I'll start learning right uh, away. I'll have, Absolutely. I'll have a few phrases to, to throw your way in. Anyway. Yeah, I should have put, you, I, I should have put you on this. I never remember them. <laughs> yeah, I should have put you on the spot and said, "Can you say goodbye in in, in Afrikaans?" But I won't do that this time. Okay, I won't do that this time. I just want to finally say thank you for joining me. It was great to catch up, even though you are ten thousand kilometers away, in what looks like an absolutely beautiful spot. I'm here in my little. It's actually raining outside, and it's dark, and it's only seven o'clock, and we're going into level five, but um. It was brilliant to chat to you and I hope our listeners enjoy and stay tuned to your Instagram because you've put lots of nice pictures up there of where you are and, and rub it in all our faces and yeah, brilliant. Great to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's my new favourite podcast. You kind of sum up the um, the Irish news very well so that I don't have to trawl through it. So it's very convenient. So thank yeah. you for that. That was Ashling Farrell, who I joined up with during the week via Zoom in terms of getting her story from South Africa, Cape Town, and getting a different perspective and getting my nose into the business of what's going on in South Africa. Again, guys, thanks for listening this week. Hopefully you got some insight into what's going on in the last seven days here in Ireland. Uh, I hope you can follow me on Instagram at the Big Nose Podcaster. You find me on Facebook under Pierce Cromwell and you will find this podcast available and all my other podcasts available where you normally get your podcasts. Going into the midterm break, I hope you all have a great week. Uh, stay safe. Don't be playing around with bangers and sparklers and we'll chat again next week with more stories that made the headlines in Ireland.